they're just bomb proof. You know, I've been in Antarctica. We got hit by a hundred knot storm, which is 185 kilometer of winds in them. I am Petra Hilleberg, and I am here with uh, polar explorer, master polar guide, kite skier and surfer, filmmaker, dog musher, photographer, and overall amazing adventurer, Sarah McNair Landry. Thank you. I'm happy to be here and to be able to chat. Yes, uh, I'm really excited to have you. We've known each other for a long time, but it's the first uh, tent talk that we do. So that's exciting. So you are basically polar royalty and you grew up with two of the most famous uh, polar explorer, Maddie McNair and Paul Landry. Um, how did that, how was that growing up? Um, I mean, for me, it was normal. <laughs> it's what I knew. Um, but uh, I definitely got dragged on a lot of camping trips and uh, whether it's hiking or dog sledding, um, skiing a little later on. And it was kind of part of our day to day life. You know, we had a my parents always had a dog team and I grew up in the Arctic. So it was uh, yeah, it was, for me, it was normal childhood. My parents moved to Southern Baffin Island, where I still live, and uh, decided to raise my brother and I here. So it's uh, Baffin Island's home. Yeah. How, how big is your hometown? Um, it's actually grown a lot since okay. uh, my parents moved up. It's uh, tripled in size, and so now it's about 7,000 people live here. So it's a okay. little city. Okay. Yeah. That's good. But obviously you live basically with nature at your back door. Exactly. Yeah. We, I can literally just walk out my door and kite ski or dog sled. And uh, it's just, you know, thousands of kilometers without roads. Yeah. Um, so are you naturally born or drawn towards um, colder areas and polar areas because of where you live or? A hundred percent. I think the cold is like my happy zone. Um, it, I can be quite miserable in the heat. I have to I admit. Agree. I agree. <laughs> cold is easier to handle. <laughs> but you yeah. have done some, uh, you've still done some uh, desert trip. You've uh, crossed the Sahara by camel and uh, the Gobi Desert by kite buggy kiting kite kite buggy kiting across the gobi so how did that happen um it was just i guess the kite expedition across the gobi desert was the first one and it was uh with my brother and we were just looking for new challenges and different zones and um the idea of crossing the desert had always really interested us um, and it was really fun. It was totally outside of our comfort zone. Um, you know, still very cold nights, but extremely hot days and um, just different challenges um, like wa water. You know, that's not something that we have to worry about in the Arctic when you have snow out of your back door and you can just mm -hmm. melt snow all the time. And all of a sudden, you know, that was like our biggest worry is like, how, how to carry the water, how much water we need, where to get water. Um, but it's, um, yeah, Mongolia is a beautiful place. I, we went back the next summer for a canoe um, trip and spent the whole summer there again. And it's, uh, it, it reminds me a lot of, of the Arctic in some ways. Right. Uh, but that's when you decided that you like, you prefer cold over hot <laughs> that in the Sahara. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Sahara was hot. <laughs> it was, it was, um, yeah, a little too hot for my comfort levels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, your expedition resume is longer and more impressive than what you find on most. But it's only like one of your expeditions would be considered an, an, just an incredible achievement for anyone who have done once. And you have basically all of them. You have the poles, you have the 
the uh, the desert, and and now you the last or some years ago you also started whitewater kayaking. I was a sea kayaking probably came naturally from where you live, but whitewater kayaking with one of the best paddlers in the world, uh, Eric Boomer, and have done some incredible um, whitewater trips as well. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been so fun to uh, to mix up the expeditions and to, you know, my passion is still winter dog sledding, uh, kite skiing, but um, uh, Eric Boomer, my partner, who's an amazing kayaker, has been teaching me how to kayak and we've gotten to do some really cool expeditions in Greenland and Baffin. Um, and then lately we've both been learning to climb as well. So we've uh, spent the last two summers uh, doing climbing expeditions in, in Baffin Island um, as well, which has been amazing. Um, it's uh, COVID's definitely made it hard to travel, but it's also forced us to spend more time in our own backyard where we live because Baffin Island has is massive and has such incredible um, cliffs and rivers and so much just unexplored terrain that it's been really fun to spend time here yeah. kind of exploring our own backyard. Not the worst place to be um, uh, not able to travel from. Um, <laughs> but so I think when most people say that they started climbing two years ago, um, that is a little bit usually maybe on a different scale than where how you excel on adventure sports like that. Because the, the walls that you've been doing now are not necessarily someone who's climbed for two years, right? Would you say? Uh, we started climbing a little bit a couple of years ago. Um, it's probably been four years. Um, and there's been a lot of learning. Um, on expedition, <laughs> um, which some people might think that, you know, Baffin's not the place to learn, but it's her home. And I think it's, it's you know, what better place to learn than in your own backyard. Um, but it's been, yeah, we've just been putting a lot of energy into it and putting a lot of time into learning and how to be safe and how to climb these big walls and um, it's been really fun. It's it's just uh, kind of a, a fun new challenge. Um, and yeah. we're just always surrounded, you know, these expeditions were always skiing past all this, these cool cliffs or big rivers or cool terrain to ski. So it's been fun to kind of combine sports and into more multi-sport expeditions. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, as I said, this this photo is taken from one of your national parks uh, on Baffin, right? Yeah. It was, yeah. It was taken um, in Ayuitic National Park. Well, uh, Boomer and I were doing the, the circumnavigation of Baffin with dogs. Okay. Um, so obviously, uh, because of how much you are outdoors or basically live outdoors more or less, um, you have obviously spent a lot of nights in tents. <laughs> Since Many. you were very small. <laughs> I often say that I'm more or less born in a tent, but I think you probably also fall in that category. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we have that in common. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so um, I know you use a lot of carons because that's a natural, because of the expeditions that you do. And, and um, kind of why do you keep coming back to that uh, or to to the, the caron models? Um, they're amazing tents. I, I love them. Um, one is they are really easy to set up and quick to set up in winds and in the cold and um they're they're just bomb proof you know i've been in antarctica we got hit by a hundred knot storm which is 185 kilometer hour winds in them and i just have full confidence that they'll be fine in in any storm um which is huge when you're out in the middle of nowhere and and in these super windy remote locations um and they're also really comfortable um 
the extended vestibule is one of my favorite features of them. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you've, you've been stuck in a, a blown in in some tents. You spent many days and nights waiting out a storm. Yes, yeah, <laughs> too many at times, but. <laughs> then it's nice to have that extra space, huh? Yeah, it's great. And you can just put so much gear. It's like such a great place to repair gear if it's stormy outside. And it just kind of expands all your options of what you can use the tent for. Just having that extra, extra room. Awesome. Um, you have some other models that you use a bit as well. I know you've used the Citrus and even the Altai a little bit. Um, are there do you have thoughts on those or like how you've been using those or when you've chosen a different model? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, the, the Kiron is great for the, the big winter trips. Um, and I've used lighter models, um, especially on whitewater kayaking trips because we have limited space in our kayaks and we need to cram two weeks of food and gear into the kayak. So then weight and size is a huge issue. Um, and that's when some of the lighter models are super, are just like so great. They just like take no space, they fit into the boat. We don't have to even think about it. Mm. Yeah. Um, Cause the, um, obviously for, big, for longer winter expeditions, like you do so much, uh, you know, going a size up um, and having that little extra bit of comfort makes a really big difference. Uh, and having the two entrances and two vestibules when you're guiding, I think is probably also uh, good. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, on, on these long expeditions, we're just in the tent for so long. It's, it's for me, it's worth having that extra little bit of weight for the extended vestibule and for snow flaps and for these features that might make the tent heavier, but it also makes it so much more comfortable. And, you know, the picture behind you is a 120 day expedition. So um, you want a tent that's going to be comfortable and um, often in the winter I'll size up. So if there's two of us, I'll bring a three person tent because it just gives us that extra room because, um, you know, essentially it's our home for four months or three months or however long the expedition is. Um, and yeah, it's just, it, it, as you know, other summer expeditions, it's, we're only out for a couple of weeks and it's like, okay, we can pack really light and we don't need that extra space and extra comfort. Um, and that's where some of the lighter models come in handy. Yeah. For some people, that would probably be a reverse. You say that uh, your really long expeditions are always in the winter and your shorter ones are in the summer. I think most people probably have the opposite view. Uh, <laughs> what do you say? Um, I mean, the winter is such a great time to travel, especially in the Arctic. It's just, um, it's, it's harder to hike with a lot of gear on your back or to paddle with a lot of gear. As for us, our access is snow and and once the ocean freezes, we can travel anywhere. And um, so in a lot of these places, it's it's a lot more accessible in the winter time to travel. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you what do you say to people that are um, that have been out uh, backpacking in the summer a little bit and want to take that step to going out in the winter? What are some things they should think about? Um, I teach a lot of polar training, so people who wanna gain the experience and the skills to do either longer adventures or big expeditions. And the one thing I always say is just, it's all these little steps to get to your final goal. Um, just getting the experience and going out camping. And if somebody wants to learn how to winter camp, um, you know, even just like, hiking 10 minutes off the off a trail and set up your tent and creating these situations where it's safe. If something goes wrong, you can still like get back, um, but you're just like getting that experience. And it's the same thing for me. I didn't just start doing expeditions one day. I spent a lot of time doing overnight trips or two, day, two night trips or week long trips. And slowly as I gained the experience, the trips got bigger and bigger. 
and um, and then I started doing exhibitions. So it's just creating those, having that goal, and then creating very attainable steps to like slowly gain that experience till you have the skills and the experience to be able to head out on longer exhibitions and adventures. Yeah, I also think that, I think that the mental the step of taking that first overnight is hard. I think a lot of people think it is very, very different from going in the summer, but it really is just a little more planning for your gear and your equipment, I think. I know. Yeah. And as you know, it's just having the right gear, yes. having if you have the right gear, you can be happy and comfortable in the cold and it's it's, you're not gonna be freezing the whole time. Um, but I think there's the, there's a block there of like, oh, it's gonna be so cold. Yeah. But honestly, you know, we just, if you have the right gear, it's, it's comfortable and it's fun. Exactly. So with someone who has this much experience and you have so many different uh, trips under your belt, how do you decide what's next? And how do you plan for your next upcoming trip? Mm. Honestly, it's just whatever sounds like a good idea at the time, <laughs> whatever sounds fun and exciting. And, you know, I definitely have like a idea bank of exhibitions that I'd love to do. Um, For example, and... what are some of those? Well, I mean, there's always more kite skiing and uh, dog sled expeditions. Um, this, the next one is, uh, this summer, uh, Eric Boomer and I are gonna head back out on expedition. So we're gonna leave from a small community on the east coast of Baffin Island, and then ski into a really cool fjord. Um, and we'll ski in kind of late spring. So there'll still be time to do some backcountry skiing on the way in. And then we're gonna create a little base camp and um, climb for several weeks and then from there we're gonna we'll be we'll have our white water kayaks as well so we'll hike inland to go paddle some new rivers um, oh wow so do you so do you you're going in the springs uh, on the snow so you, do you carry everything or you pull everything in behind you then do you pull your kayaks and your climbing gear and uh base camp and all of that yeah well you're gonna load up our kayaks with all of our gear um our climb gear and when i say base camp really it's a hilliburg tent <laughs> it's pretty small well, that's a base camp um, <laughs> <laughs> um, perfect base camp uh, but yeah so we're gonna we're gonna ski in over the sea ice and the idea is that we're gonna ski in before the snow melts because that's the easiest way to travel in yeah. and then once the sea ice starts to melt and break up there's this kind of no travel period where it's too broken up to ski on but there's too much ice to get a boat in um, so essentially we're gonna get in before the ice starts to break up and then get stuck there okay. till till early August when the ice is broken up enough um, that we can get a boat pick out is the plan. And do you bring food for that long? Or you? Yeah. yeah. You um, so it's gonna be heavy. <laughs> Very We're heavy. gonna have heavy food. <laughs> I know we have all the toys. <laughs> Plus all our food, our camping gear, our you know fuel for our stoves. Um, we're going to be we're going to be going in pretty heavy. Are you uh, so photography and filmmaking is also something that you do a lot of? Um, will you be doing that on this upcoming expedition and bringing a film a film equipment as well on uh, your heavy equipment or no? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, our plan is to uh, self-film and create a, a, a documentary, adventure documentary from this. So that's one of our big goals is not only to ski, climb and kayak, but also to really do a good job capturing it both through photos and through video and um, yeah, and just tell that, tell, tell our story. 
because awesome. uh, like Eric Boomer uh, as a professional paddler is obviously uh, in a bit of a more um, high profile industry for a long time where sponsors and like kind of like that whole uh, media circle was it's bigger than traditionally in a polar in the polar world um, mm -hmm. how, would you say you guys have blended those worlds a little bit um, by accident maybe or <laughs> yeah I think so um, for sure especially with uh, you know the first expedition we really did where we blended the two worlds was um, uh, along with a good friend of ours Ben Stooksbury we did a cross on the Greenland ice cap tow in our kayaks to access this really remote river in Greenland which we paddled down to the ocean and um, it's been really fun to just learn why water kayaking and it's such a special way to travel just being able to follow these rivers and travel down them and um, it's uh, yeah I love it yeah but with that you also uh, brought in more camera and more film work would you say um... And have been doing more, yeah. more, more filming. Yeah, more and more. Boomer's a, a professional photographer as well, so he's more on the photography side, and and I came more from the film world. So it's been fun to combine kind of our two our skills and and uh, yeah, create these photos and video projects together. Because you've done some of the like the the. Um... Uh, film tours as well so like um, showing your your films on the different tours right yeah yeah and and actually these last two years just because um because of of covid and um lack of you know guide a lot of the work i do is guiding and and without with all the travel restrictions in baffin it's been pretty quiet so i've i've really s switched over into doing more and more film work these last two years which has been really fun and different and challenging and new yeah that's good so are you planning on continuing doing both your own expeditions and guiding and filmmaking and all the things continue yeah i i think i easily get bored so it's nice to keep <laughs> keep things fresh and new and different and um, I love it all. I, I, I love doing, um, my own expeditions. Um, but it's also really fun to bring other people out on expedition and, and, and guide them. And we do every year we teach these polar training courses, which are two weeks long. And it's, it's really fun to get people, uh, and just to teach them all the skills and to watch them progress and, and watch them kind of fall in love with polar travel and, um, and film and photography is also really exciting and challenging in its own way. So it's, um, yeah, it's been kind of really fun to do a little bit of everything. Yeah. I have to say someone, if you, you're saying that you, someone who gets bored really fast, um, some of like, Greenland and some of the South Pole, there's a very, very long distance of only white for days and days and days. <laughs> that doesn't bore you? Uh, yeah, um, you know, it's, it's like forced meditation. <laughs> um, it's funny you mentioned that because somebody was just asking me about um, I got an expedition to the Pole of Inaccessibility and in Antarctica, which was just under 80 days. And the first 15 days we skied through the Queen Maud uh, mountain range and it was beautiful. But then after that, it's just white in every direction. And uh, once the mountains were so beautiful, I never listened to music and we were in crevasse areas too. So I didn't. Right. you know i had to be aware and not listen to the music but as soon as we got through and there's like white in every direction um i finally pulled out my phone to listen to music and apparently a, a lot of these music subscriptions if you don't sign on to the internet every 30 days they just delete all oh, your no. music <laughs> so it was uh 
Yeah, I was in my own thoughts a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no music. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Okay. Do you have some other uh, fun uh, memories or uh, stories from uh, tent adventures or being with the tent? From tent adventures? Um, I mean, I know technically yeah. all your adventures to some extent are tent adventures, but kind of like a story with a tent or a memory. That involves a tent. I was actually just going through my tents and um, it's, I started writing on them what expeditions they've done just because it's oh, fun nice. to remember. And uh, I came across uh, the tent that I brought through the Northwest Passage uh, with my brother in 2011. Mm -hmm. And um, it still has some, we got a bear that came in the camp one night and it has, um, several nice claw marks in the vestibule side of it. Okay. Um, we can fix that yeah. for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that something yeah. you're worried about uh, polar bears when you're out in some area in the polar bear areas? Yeah. Yeah. We're always, I mean, different areas in Bath and have higher or lower risk depending on where you are and how near you are to polar bear zones but it's it's something that we always have to be aware of and traveling with dogs is great um right. especially like a pack of 16 of them because the polar bear is not going to sneak into camp unnoticed those dogs are going to bark and they're going to wake us up and yeah. um but it's it's uh, a little bit riskier traveling without dogs um right. so Oftentimes we'll have some sort of perimeter fence, um, Electric, like a trip electrical wire fence. Electrical. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just something that if a bear comes in, it'll it'll warn us. Um, some of them are like a trip wire, and they have a flare that goes off. There's different models. Okay. And um, but um, yeah, some sort of warning system, and and then of course we always travel with the bear deterrents and. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for talking to us. Um, it's uh, your accomplishments that you've done. It, it's really amazing. And your your trip resume and expedition resume is more impressive than um, at your young age than what most people can ever dream of in a lifetime. So it's really uh, inspiring to talk to you. Um, and I love how how down to earth you are and how um, how natural just being outdoors comes to you, not for awards or um, necessarily publicity or just because you love to be out. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, so if, if someone wants to um, go on one of your polar training courses or maybe an expedition or um, how do they find your follow along on your expedition? How do they found, find you? Um, probably the best way is through uh, my website. It's northwindsexpeditions.com and it has info on all the trainings and expeditions that we offer. Um, or Instagram, of course, is a good place too. It's at Sarah McNair Landry. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us and for talking to us. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs>